This is what you call a mobile home. Everything he owns is in there. He's got it parked at the moment. My donors have not already gotten a letter. They will get one shortly offering to refund the money and the donations that they have made to my campaign. You can't transfer campaign funds from one campaign to another campaign. Um, and people very generously gave to our campaign, and I think it's only appropriate that I offer to return those funds to them. Um, in terms of the future, I don't know what the future holds for me. I know I will be mayor uh, until the first Tuesday in January. And what I have always said is that I want to leave the city better than I found it. So I will keep doing all of the things that we have done each and every day. We are going to keep working on affordable housing. We are going to continue to work to make sure that people who are living on our streets have a home and the supportive services that they need. And we are going to continue to do every single thing in our power to make the city safer. Target members of the LGBTQ community through a dating app called Grinder. Sergeant Rodney Jones says eight victims have been robbed since February. The suspect would use the Grinder app to exchange and identify victims, trying to lure them to a dating uh, location. After the date concludes, the uh, suspect would then rob the victim, often taking wallet keys or even uh, vehicles. It's an armed robbery. The person typically has a handgun. Police would not specify the locations where the robberies took place, but say they do have a good description of at least one robbery suspect. A dark, complected African-American male. Uh, he's in his late teens, early 20s. Uh, he's approximately 5'11", 6 feet in height. Slim, but yet muscular build, uh, with his hair three to four inches uh, and small twists or dreads. Investigators say the suspects are usually vague about where they want to meet their dates or try to lure dates to a remote location. Officer Eric Lang says that is a telltale sign of trouble. If you are trying to FaceTime somebody or get an address and are kind of hesitant, they give you a location of a cemetery or someplace you don't know, um, take that as a sign. Um, get a physical address. Typically, what happens is people will randomly choose a picture, um, and then constantly you'll see somebody say, hey, this is not me um, posting. So it just they do it so frequently that people never know who actually kind of they're talking to. So it just happens. They just randomly pick somebody. Atlanta police suspect their son or your father or your brother or your uncle, you would be out here saying the same thing. While he was walking to his car, he was approached by a black Nissan Sentra that was recently carjacked in Midtown around the area of Spring Street and Third Street. There were three suspects associated with that vehicle. As uh, Mr. Houston was walking to his car, one of the suspects exited the vehicle and shot Mr. Houston, killing him. Stephen Hennessy of the Hennessy Auto Group says Houston was one of his best employees, a car salesman who started working for Hennessy after Houston left law school a couple of years ago to make money to pay for law school tuition. In a statement to Fox 5, Hennessy said he was everybody's favorite employee, hardworking, dedicated, with a great attitude, just a great young man. I really hope someone will come forward in this case, especially since there is a reward. I never thought I'd be in this situation, me or my family members, because he did everything he was supposed to do to keep him from being in this type of situation with this unnecessary gun violence. We're going to have to work together, especially as black people, because this can't keep happening. We're, we're killing all these good kids, good, uh, killing all the good men, and leaving all the rotten ones out here. In Atlanta, Portia Bruner, Fox 5 News. One today, but he's still facing the criminal case. Here is Governor Brian Kemp from earlier today. Every police officer, uh, and there's a lot of good ones out there. There are bad actors that, that you have to deal with and, and deal with appropriately, and I'm certainly supportive of that, as, as our state law enforcement agencies are. But police and everybody deserves due process. 
The decision today brought out a handful of protesters to City Hall with many calling for justice for Rayshard Brooks. Roth will not be on the street with a badge and a gun until the criminal trial is resolved. John Sherrick live tonight for us in downtown Atlanta with our top story. Now, John, there is an uncertain forecast when it comes to what's next here. Absolutely, and there are accusations from all sides in this case about rushing to judgment. That there was a rush to judgment last summer when Rayshard Brooks ended up being shot and killed. And that after that there was a rush to judgment against the officers, which has, for now, ironically, ended up stalling this case. The Atlanta Civil Service Board just ruled that last June, then Atlanta police officer Garrett Rolfe should not have been fired so quickly by Atlanta's mayor. The board ruled that right after Rolfe shot and killed Rayshard Brooks during an arrest, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms fired Rolfe illegally without getting Rolfe due process under the law. Rolfe's attorney, Lance LaRusso, tells us he expects Rolfe will now get back pay and a desk job while preparing for his criminal trial for murder. 11 Alive legal analyst Paige Pate. You can have the officer removed from the force, but still provide him with due process, and they didn't do it. And the attorneys for the family of Rayshard Brooks say City Hall's decision ended up hindering the prosecution of Rolfe, Chris Stewart. But it appears maybe that was done um, just to pacify all of the people that were upset, but we temporary uh, justice is not real justice. Mayor Bottoms now says because of the demonstrations at the time, she made the right call to try to keep the peace. But will the case ever get to trial? Fulton County Superior Court Chief Judge Christopher Brasher is deciding whether to grant a request from District Attorney Fonnie Willis to withdraw from the case and have an outside prosecutor take it. Oh, there's certainly the possibility that the case could never make it to trial, and not because he pleads guilty, but because the case ends up being dismissed or abandoned. And the advanced its own resolution to create a citizens committee to try to find some solutions. It's a commission to look at public safety because someone, I think right now we're all grasping at straws because crime is awful. It's, it's bad out there. Atlanta City Councilwoman Carla Smith co-sponsored the Atlanta resolution yet has low expectations for crime study committee. I think people are out there looking for a magic answer to crime. Smith has been a city council member for 20 years and announced last weekend she won't run again this year. A decade ago, she was among those in Atlanta who watched the city's crime rate drop year after year as the economy started to boom and now is among those who think the pandemic is a big part of the reason crime has spiked. Crime goes back. Do you think crime will cycle back down the way it cycled back up? Crime wave. It will. The tide will recede. But Smith thinks politicians can help crime recede by striking a balance between punishing criminals and not packing jails with lesser offenders. Former Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed is weighing in on the issue of crime in the city as well. The two-term mayor had a lot to say about what we're seeing in the city when it comes to crime and how to turn things around. The former mayor called it a crime crisis, not a COVID crisis, saying it goes beyond the pandemic. He says things are worse in Atlanta than in other major cities that have seen smaller increases in crime. And he's frustrated, saying he saw the, the we all saw the early signs of a problem and didn't do enough to address it. He believes recreation centers for young people need to be open longer. And he says the city needs direct physical contact and engagement from not only police, but also from elected officials and community members in impacted areas. But he also cautions it is going to take time to get these numbers down. We are at a moment of crisis. Atlanta is a big, beautiful, bold tapestry. But a tapestry has to be weaved together and that weaving has to be maintained. And so my fear is that we're seeing all of these things happen right in front of us in slow motion. Everybody's talking about it at their dinner tables and we're not raising the alert to a crisis level, which is what it is. My conversation. I would love to have a closure date on the books and, and what is most liberating about not running for office, I, that conversation can be moved off the table about any decisions that I'm making because I'm running for re-election. So I want to keep pushing for the closure in the same way I started pushing for it my first year in office. I'm not going to let up. Speak to your critics, speak to the time again, making this decision out of faith, not fear. Speak to the 
tell us what you're criticizing, especially given the news of this week that you're folding under pressure. How do you want to fill out a speech? I dealt with pressure. I started dealing with pressure when I was eight years old, and I saw my father being let out of our house in handcuffs. So if anybody thinks a decision about reinstating an employee would run me out of office is someone who doesn't know me very well. I didn't fold under pressure last summer. I didn't fold under pressure when I ran against 15 other people for mayor. I didn't fold under pressure when I ran against 10 other people when I ran for city council. I didn't fold under pressure when I took on an incumbent in my first election that I lost, but I still got up and I did it again. So I may bend, but I will never break. Mary Bonds, do you think that election is likely to be uh, turning to a bidding war on criminal justice issues? With your exit from the race, do you believe that puts progressive reforms on criminal justice at risk? I think, I think reform on criminal justice is at risk, period. The will that we had in my first year in office in 2018, the entire nation was favoring criminal justice reform. What I see now with the uptick in crime across the country is that we're going back the other way as a country, back to lock them all up and throw away the key. And the danger in that is that it gets us to moments like this. So we have to do short-term things to address issues in our communities with crime, but you have to think long-term on how you break those systemic issues that lead people to make decisions to commit crimes. Yeah, I find it mighty funny that the city feels that they need to take the existing jail and turn it into an outreach center when they already have one it's called gateway right there next door to the existing jail at you know i guess gateway failed in what it was supposed to do so what does uh, Keisha Lance Bonham think that closing out jail and not having any place to put lawbreakers is the right thing to do? I guess just uh, write him a ticket and let him go and expect him to show up in court. Catch and release, catch and release. It's never a good option. <laughs>